Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10 o'clock to 10.30 a.m. session of the 2018 Open Simulator Community Conference. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC18. This session, we are happy to introduce a terrific presentation called How Can We Show the Passage of Time in History Builds? Our speaker today is Graham Mills. Graham Mills is a retired university academic with an amateur interest in the history of Liverpool and its railways. He uses OpenSim as an aid to better understanding issues of place and scale in historical contexts. Welcome all. Let's begin the session. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here again. Um, I've been working, I actually have a speakeasy uh, card. So uh, for those who wish to have some sort of record of what's going on, uh, hopefully that will show up for you. I will try not to read this. <laughs> um, I've been developing this build for the last couple of years. Um, you can see now that it's getting quite extensive. I should hasten to add that it's actually um, based in part on historical evidence, but also there's a fair amount of conjecture. So as you can see here, um, we have an arch and a, um, a building at the front here, and uh, there's a certain amount of um, storytelling as there's going on in the construction of those. We know that they existed. We don't know quite how they appeared. Beyond the entrance arch there, uh, you can see there is a uh, station um, and a train shed and a couple, at least just probably just see a yellow um, uh, carriage there. So the, the key thing to make clear here is that this was in many respects the first railway terminus anywhere. Okay, so it has a lot of historical significance. It was the Liverpool terminus of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, uh, which was established in 1830. And bear in mind, that is seven years before Queen Victoria came to the throne. It was a Georgian enterprise. And it's a fascinating topic. Uh, it's not just about trains uh, and locomotives. It's about context. It's about economics, it's about entrepreneurship, it's about uh, the differences between the different cities. Liverpool and Manchester turn out to be very different. Liverpool, a seaport, Manchester dependent upon uh, trade uh, through the seaport, but very much uh, a centre of manufacturing, particularly in the textile industry. Politics comes into it as well. So for me, I'm not an expert on any of this. It's a, it's a learning opportunity more than anything else. Uh, I should make uh, make it clear. <laughs> I've already forgotten to press on all the buttons. So there we go. Too many buttons. So you can see there's nothing left of Crown Street. Um, it's now a public park. Uh, there is a sort of uh, explainer or the remains of one and this giant ventilation shaft on the right that you can see in the slide. And there's a reverse view at the bottom left. And this, in fact, is for a, um, uh, a tunnel that runs uh, into the distance and, in fact, takes uh, uh, or took freight uh, carriages uh, down to the docks and back up again. Uh, it wasn't there in 1830. It was added around about the late 1890s. I'll just draw your attention to the little highlighted area in the reverse view. Um, that, I think, is the location of a, a shaft, an eye, that was used in the construction of the tunnel. And that becomes significant in the story later on. So a lot of it's based on published prints, but the problem was that these published prints are really a snapshot. So it's what people wanted to convey in terms of making railway travel attractive. Um, it wasn't necessarily what was there over time, and particularly during the phase of actually constructing uh, the station, because the station operated only for six years, and the station was 
thereafter demolished quite rapidly. Um, so there really is nothing left to speak of anymore. So I've got a couple of uh, thoughts on how these changes over time might be represented. Um, it's not enough just to have a single build stuck in time, however close to the actual representation uh, of the final station. So the station um, was accessed via these tunnels that you can see. In fact, um, one of them is uh, missing here. Uh, it's the one in the middle of the photograph at the top. Uh, this was the large freight tunnel that went down to the docks, two kilometers long. Um, so very, uh, very extensive for the time. Uh, there is also next to it a small tunnel. And this tunnel actually came into that bank. Um, Hold on, my mic is open. Ah, oh, okay, somebody else's mic is open. Okay, that's fine. Um, so um, all I can say is that there are two questions that I was interested in getting answers to. Uh, one is who was the architect for the actual station building? And roughly, when was the station built? We know the project started in uh, 1826 uh, in terms of construction and then uh, the opening in September 1830. So sometime during that phase, can we narrow in on the actual date? As far as the architect is concerned, the uh, principal engineer for the whole line was a guy called George Stevenson, um, who often gets credit for lots of things, in particular, um, devising the rocket locomotive. So uh, he gets the credit for many things, but in fact, there were a lot of other people involved. Sorry, I'm way behind on all my... So these are the tunnels. Um, So the big step forward was to recognize that there actually is a building in Liverpool, um, a Georgian country house called Sudley, uh, that is remarkably similar to the original station. So you can see the passenger station as it would have been in 1831 at the bottom there, uh, and the uh, the tunnel at the end there is the tunnel to the, uh, the area that we saw on the previous slide. Uh, and the points I would make uh, is that somebody, uh, the suddenly at the top right there, you can see a photograph of it as it was this year, uh, was constructed in 1824. The architect was a guy called uh, John Whiteside Casson. And there are remarkable similarities also with the front door. If you look at the door in the middle there, um, you can see that it's basically very similar to the appearance in the print below. Uh, in particular, you can see uh, that if you replace that central portion, which has now got side lights uh, and uh, a top light with a huge, massive door, uh, then you've basically got the same situation as you see in the station. So my hypothesis is that the uh, guy that actually designed this is Casson. So how to represent this? Uh, this is one of the attempts uh, that I've uh, used. Um, this is a kind of 3D spidergram. And uh, what you uh, can see here is effectively a clock face. So each of the tick marks that you can see going around the circumference represents a year, uh, 1824 from the start, the formation of the station and going around uh, until its closure in 1836. Uh, all I'm trying to draw your attention to here, however, is the green marks at the top. 
And this simply shows that, and if you look at, at it from above, you can see at the top right there, uh, those green marks. And what it shows is that Kasten was actually active during that period. He was actually in his 60s, so he probably didn't want to participate much more in the railway revolution that came. Uh, but he was active for some years after the construction of the station. So my guess is uh, that, uh, that Kasten inspired, uh, if not um, designed, the station. So... In terms of the actual layout, this is an 1835 map, so it's right towards the end of the uh, lifetime of the station. Uh, and what you can see is the station in the middle there um, uh, is in highlighted in blue, and it actually is a very small part of the entire area. In particular, uh, you can see at the top right uh, the windmill, and th there was a windmill present. Um, uh, and you tend to think that the, the the mill owner must have lost out as a consequence, but in fact, he actually sold the parcel to the railway company, and he pumped water for them, uh, and uh, eventually allowed sidings to come onto his land and all sorts. So he actually did very well out of the presence of the railway. But you can see there are other yards, workshops, coal yards, uh, the place developed quite substantially uh, beyond the actual uh, station part. And the tunnels coming in from the top and only one of them goes out at the bottom because of course we've got the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the carriage coming in uh, under that bank that we saw. Uh, so how to represent this change in time? Uh, so this is the kind of least obtrusive mechanism that I've come up with, basically uh, to put a plaque with a timeline on. And I can just give you, oops, didn't mean to do that. Let's have a try again. Uh, so you can see here uh, the notion of the timeline and uh, so it was a Miller's field to start with and we can basically access different pictures uh, illustrating uh, the phases that the station development went through so in fact the addition of the train shed occurred after the station had been built so for the grand opening there was no train shed in fact people would have got a much better view as a consequence uh, from the road at the back uh, what I would point out, though, is that the, the sort of blocks of color, the red is the duration during which the, uh, the station was actually there until 1836, from the opening in 1830. But there's a gray area before that where we really don't understand precisely when the station was built. It was built sometime in that gray area. And there's a little button as well that you could use to serve note cards uh, from, and uh, uh, this can give additional context, uh, which I is fascinating for me, uh, knowing quite what was going on at this time. So that's what I call timeline. And it's the simplest, it's very unobtrusive, uh, spoils the immersion a little bit. Uh, the next one is kind of the opposite end of the scale. It's region scale. It's called time server. And basically what uh, the idea is, you have a, a number of link sets which you want to appear or disappear at particular times. You could use a resing device as well. Uh, but uh, this is uh, uh, how uh, I uh, have demonstrated it. So here we have the um, station resing in front of you. And you can see the windmill at the top uh, right there and uh, the station. And uh, this is probably around about 1830. We've got a carriage in there and everything. I've got this under control of a HUD. So I can put you back to any particular time point that I want to choose. So here we have the um, 
the situation in 1827 uh, when the uh, purchase of the field first took place. And the first thing that happened uh, was that they leveled the field, I would assume, and then they put in this eye that I mentioned at the start, the shaft that ran down uh, to the tunnel. Uh, obviously, it was underground, which is kind of a little bit difficult to model. So you'll have to imagine that it's actually under there. And it's a horse, draw, horse engine uh, that is actually uh, giving access and taking the spoil uh, from the uh, tunnel being excavated in both directions, um, uh, going down to the docks in one direction and back up to that cutting that we saw in the photograph uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, and then in about 1828, I suspect, everything uh, suddenly happened. They'd finished by that stage uh, the tunnel. Uh, they built the small tunnel through to the cutting, and then they could build the station. So what I'm saying is effectively the pre presence of the eye, the shaft, would have stopped them developing. So the station, we can hope tentatively say, probably late 1828, possibly 1829. But we can see that there is um, no... Uh, No train shed there at present. If we go forward to 1831, however, we see the train shed appear and it's much as expected uh, in, from the uh, print that we saw earlier on. So we've got effectively an operational station. And that uh, probably pretty much uh, summarizes what we could do. But it's clearly, it's, it's a great, lovely, immersive um, experience being able to modify this, uh, but unfortunately, uh, you can't actually accommodate multiple visitors as a consequence, or they'd all be doing the same sort of thing. So it's a it's, it has a sort of uh, downside to it as well. So the compromise, and this is the one that I'm demonstrating on the booth, is this thing called time frame. Uh, here you have a, and it's not completely finished yet, but you have a sort of minified version of that build that we just saw, going through the same cycle of uh, events, potentially under control of the avatar, um, displaying images, but also uh, pictures in front of the image, and also grabbing the avatar camera and taking it into particular locations if you feel so inclined. So these are the choices. Um, if you go for simplicity, you could go with note cards, you could go with posters, or you could use something like Timeline, which attempts to combine both of them. Uh, if you want to, to use 3D, then you have the option of using Time Server uh, at a regional level. The problem, as we've said, is interfer interference. You could also use teleports between separate builds, or you could swap uh, archive files or files. Uh, you could have resin scripts, and I think uh, Ramesh is going to be talking about ResMela later on, and that would be uh, an alternative there as well. And then if you want to get to the situation where you have low or zero interference, you could go for something like time frame, uh, where you're working with subregion, model-based, booth-style uh, interfaces. Uh, obviously, you'd need to stick them outside the station. They would look a little bit odd inside, uh, but uh, they could be used as some kind of introduction to the build. Uh, I've also played around a little bit with um, Convo, which people were talking about earlier on, to generate mesh files. So that's a, another alternative rather than just shrinking builds and simplifying them, as you've seen here. And then panoramas and, and cube maps, uh, again, uh, alternatives. Uh, there are other areas of Crown Street uh, that I have started to model. Um, there is uh, the mill parcel, which I talked about. So uh, this became extremely busy and complex by around about 1850. 
you can see that it's been absorbed into uh, what uh, the station then became, which was uh, a coal yard. Um, and uh, beyond that, there was also a goods office much later in around about 1890. So it became effectively the location where coal was imported for the use of what became a, a big and thriving city of Liverpool. Um, and basically it was uh, uh, a way of uh, taking coal uh, to people for heating and you know, cooking purposes in the upper reaches of the city. So what next? Well, Crown Street, as I say, closed. It became a, a cattle station. Um, the uh, replacement station was a much bigger one, much closer to the city centre. There was no need for horse omnibuses. And this was Lime Street. And again, I started to model Lime Street and the area around that as well. And although it's a much bigger station, it's, it's still only 1836. So it's a year before the, the large London termini uh, like Euston uh, actually began to be built. So um, it's, uh, it's a very um, early example of a mainline terminus, which would eventually go down to London. OK, well, thank you very much. Um, I do apologize for having overrun slightly. Um, and uh, I'll take any questions now. Yeah, OK, it looks like there's um, a question looking for the uh, name of the app that you had mentioned. OK, was wondering, is that Condor, did you say? Convor, C-O-N-V-O-A-R. It, it does a good job. Um, the, the, the problem is that it uh, supports this format uh, GITF. Um, AI Austin uh, did a nice blog. Yes, that's right, Rhiannon. And uh, about it, but there aren't, there isn't a huge amount of support in other programs uh, for uh, Convor uh, for that particular format, unfortunately. Okay, I think we have to wrap it up, but thank you very much, Graham, for your terrific presentation. Everyone give him a round of applause. You can continue talking separately if you have uh, additional questions. Thank you all so much for listening. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session, the next session will begin at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time in this keynote region and is entitled Dream Grid Open Simulator, a simple-to-use Windows-compatible open sim front end. Also, we encourage you to visit the OSCC 18 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and explore the Hypergrid Tour resources in OSCC Expo 2 region along with sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC Expo regions. Thank you again to our speakers and the audience.